Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Political Vigilante. My name is Graham Elwood. Uh, I am here with RT correspondent Caleb Maupin uh, about what just happened a couple of days ago to a, if I have this right, Press TV anchor Marzi Hashimi. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but um, Caleb, first of all, thank you for joining us on the show today. Sure. And why don't you because uh, I just became aware of this, uh, Samira Khan, who I interviewed last week uh, about uh, Syria and the Middle East, texted me this morning with this information. So why don't you, and to everybody watching, there's a, there's a, a PressTV.com article that I will put in the show notes that you can watch, and there's a news story going into the details of this. But why don't you um, bring us up to speed as to what exactly happened and, 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 what, and why? Well, Marzia Hashimi, uh, she was born Melanie Franklin. Uh, she's from Louisiana, born in New Orleans. Um, and she's lived in Iran for at least a decade. And she's been the main anchor of the Iranian English language TV network known as Press TV. Um, and, you know, she's written a lot. Um, she's given a lot of interviews. She's been featured on NPR and elsewhere. And she's just a well-known personality in Iran. Um, and, you know, she's converted to Islam. She's an African-American. Uh, she's made some documentaries about the black freedom struggle and, and police brutality and such. So she was back in the United States visiting her family. And uh, she was flying from Colorado to St. Louis. And from what we understand, at the St. Louis airport, she was arrested by the FBI uh, they then took her from St. Louis uh, in, into custody, took her to Washington, D.C., and she's now being held by the FBI in some kind of special facility in Washington, D.C. Now, we know this because she has called her family. After 48 hours of being detained, she was able to call her family and say, look, I've been arrested, I'm being held. Um, she's described the conditions she's in. She's not you know, been able to wear a headscarf. Uh, she's not been able to uh, have food that is in line with her religion. The only food they're getting is bologna sandwiches, and, you know, bologna is not, you know, n is not permitted under, under Islam. They, it's pork. Uh, so she's being held. Um, and at this point, there aren't any charges. Um, and that seems to be the most shocking part of this is, you know, I mean, if people are going to be arrested, there has to be a charge. Well, the FBI is not naming any charges against her. Um, and the FBI has not responded to anybody with inquiries about why she's been arrested. Uh, Press TV, the Iranian Foreign Ministry, uh, as well as CBS, the Associated Press, BBC, have all been trying to find out why she is being held, what she's being charged with. No answer is being given. Um, now, we know at this point the USA and Iran do not have diplomatic relations. So any uh, you know, correspondence or exchange between the two countries is being handled through, uh, through Switzerland. Um, but at this point, uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're, we're seeing a situation uh, where, where someone is being held. We don't know why. She's been able to contact her family. Her family has been trying to raise, uh, raise the alarm, basically, that, that they're, that they're you know, it's a grandmother. I mean, she's a grandmother. She has three grandchildren, uh, you know, just a well-known person in Iran. When I was in Iran, I saw that she's a celebrity. I mean, people would stop on the street and recognize her. She's just a very well-known voice in Iranian media, kind of an expert on the affairs of the United States, in particular the, the issue with African Americans. And she's been, been detained by the federal government, by the FBI, and people don't know what's going on. And, and the government is being silent about what's happening. Well, I mean... Uh it's it's pretty insane to to when I read the story and then to hear what you're saying, but it's also and then some in, in other ways it's not because this is sort of what the American government has done. I mean, the majority of the people at Guantanamo weren't even terrorists; they were just, you know, I, the American military went to people in Afghanistan and Pakistan and said, "Hey, send us your terrorists," and they just sent like the the, the whatever tribal feud. Uh, they were they were people that were sent to us, and and then reading specifically her story, uh, it's it's unbelievable because it's like well it is believable you know and and the the thing that is so one of the main things that well first that this is happening is very disturbing, but also of course I don't find, I don't see no one is talking about this in the mainstream media, nobody is is covering this. There's no outrage. Um, that I can see, I mean, from going online today and, and I don't see any, I don't see any mainstream outlets talking about this in any capacity just because, you know, Iran is, a, is, is they're the bad guys. So we, we just, we sort of, 
the media, the corporate media in America just sort of selectively chooses who, who to get outraged about. Like they didn't seem, you know, I'm glad there was a lot of coverage about Kosoji, um, but it's still just not enough. And this, this just, she's detained with, as you were saying, there's no, she's a grandmother. There's no, <laughs> what, what are the charges? What did she do? Yeah, none of those questions are being answered. Um, and, I mean, the thing is, we've seen there has been an article published by BBC. There has been an article published by CBS. Um, and, you know, people just want to know what exactly is happening. Um, and you can bet if there was a top journalist, someone who was a household name in, say, Britain or France or Germany uh, that had just been grabbed by U.S. federal officials, the whole world would be wanting to know what had happened. But because Iran has been very much singled out, um, you know, by U.S. foreign policy, uh, you know, because of that, uh, we're seeing almost a double standard here. If you read, not, uh, you know, Press TV has reported on this, RT has reported on this, RT America has reported on this. Um, but if you read the article in CBS, they almost treat this, you know, very, very odd. It's almost like most of the article doesn't even, you know, it starts out talking about, you know, Marzia Hashimi, doesn't give a lot of specifics. But then from there it goes into, yes, and there are these four Americans who are being detained in Iran. And you almost wonder, like the article is trying to make the point that somehow uh, it seems it, it, it seems like this is just, just you know, tit for tat or something like that. You have to wonder what's really going on here. But this comes in the context that we recently found out that John Bolton um, has been pressing for some kind of attack on, on Iran within the Trump administration. Uh, we, we know that, you know, we saw how Donald Trump pulled out of the Iran nuclear agreement that was really the, the crowning achievement of the Obama administration. And that there's a real escalation of tension between the United States and Iran by the Trump administration. And I think you can, you can probably fit this in with that tension. Uh, the, the fact that she's been grabbed like this. But again, we haven't heard from the FBI what the charge is, what's going on here. We, we have so little information. That's what's so disturbing is that they would, not, they would not even give an explanation. You know, if you're going to arrest somebody and then take them halfway across the country and hold them in a federal facility, uh, there should be an explanation. The public should know what is happening. Yeah, so I, I mean... I'm, I'm, I'm very much at a loss for words. So what, I, I don't know, what can we do? How can we, how can we even get any straight answers from about this? Well, I mean, that's, again, I, I mean, I'm a journalist and I'm, my job is to get to the truth. And I think there's a lot of people all over the world that just want to know what is going on here. I mean, our constitution makes it very clear that you can't hold people without charges, right? If you're going to arrest somebody, you have to hold them and charge them with a crime. Uh, but we've seen, you know, an escalation in U.S. legislation of, you know, the Bush administration calling people enemy combatants. We, we know the NDAA that was passed by the Obama administration that allowed for, you know, indefinite detention of individuals. And we've seen a gradual rolling back of the civil liberties of Americans in, in the past, you know, few years, especially in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks. Um, and, and there's been a real, real escalation. And, you know, you can put this in the context of, you know, the NSA listening to our phone calls, uh, you know, the surveillance that's been going on that was revealed. Uh, you know, there's, there's many, there's many, many ways you can fit this in. But, but this is very dangerous because at this point, you know, many people were very happy when Donald Trump announced that the, the U.S. military was pulling out of Syria and Afghanistan. Um, and, and at that point... Uh, there was outcry from many Republicans because they said, look, you're handing Syria over to Iran. Well, no, Syria has, has been getting support from Iran. Uh, you know, Iran has been there supporting the legitimate, internationally recognized government of Syria, right? I Iran has already got Iraq in chaos on its one border. It doesn't want to have Syria in chaos and the Syrian government to have fallen on its, its other border, right? Iran has already suffered terrorist attacks from ISIS, and Iran has been working with the Syrian government to try and stabilize the country, but Iran is not trying to take over Syria. That's just that's just a, a misnomer, but we've heard that come out of Israel. The Netanyahu forces in Israel have been pushing that line that somehow uh, this is, you know, this is Iran is moving into Syria to attack Israel or something to that effect. Iran is trying to keep you know, a country on its border from, from disintegrating into chaos. Afghanistan's already in chaos. Iraq is in chaos. Iran is trying to keep Syria together. It's trying to play a stabilizing role there. And we saw, you know, Mitch McConnell and other Republicans denouncing Trump mm -hmm. when he announced the pullout of troops from from Syria and saying, oh, you're handing Syria over to the Iranians. Uh, and so you have to wonder what's going on here. There's a lot of international incidents 
that take place, where you almost get the idea that within the Trump administration, there are different foreign policy agendas, that the, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, or maybe the left hand does know what the right hand is doing, but is doing something else on its own, you know. Uh, for example, you know, and Trump was in Argentina meeting uh, with President Xi of China, reaching an agreement. As that was going on, we saw the, the CFO, the chief financial officer, of the biggest cell phone uh, telecommunications manufacturer in the world, Huawei, being grabbed in Canada at the behest of, of U.S. officials, and now there's a call to extradite her. And so, you know, Trump, you know, we get the impression that he didn't even know that was happening. He thought we had just made a great historic agreement with China and Argentina, and then, and then we see now a very, very important Chinese businesswoman being grabbed in Canada, and that throws everything back into question. Um, I mean, you know, whether it's Bolton, Pompeo, and the lead-up to Trump's meeting with Kim Jong-un, the historic meeting in Singapore, and the lead-up to that, we saw uh, Bolton coming out and saying that Libya scenarios might be the ultimate answer, and, and you get the idea there are different agendas within the administration, and, and that makes me wonder what exactly is going on here. It's pretty clear that Trump has made an alliance with the Likud party in Israel, with Netanyahu, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, fi figures like Sheldon Adelson that are very close to that wing of Israeli politics, and they have a real Iran obsession. Iran is, Iran is, as far as they're concerned, is the greatest force of evil. We should absolutely hate Iran. So it would make sense that they would be very happy to see Donald Trump uh, have a, a prominent uh, American-born Iranian reporter grabbed. Uh, but then again, we don't know. I mean, we just don't have any information here. But it's very scary. And the scary thing is, you know, a lot of times civil liberties advocates will talk about what they call a chill effect. Where if you, if you engage in suppression, not only is that a violation of the civil liberties of the person you're suppressing, but it's also a violation of the civil liberties of all kinds of other people who see it happen and then don't engage in speech or journalism or, you know, uh, political activism or, or what have you because they're afraid, because they're terrified by the, the chill effect that it has to engage in repression, political repression against an individual. So, you know, if you look at this, uh, this is sending a message to all kinds of people in the United States, you know, don't appear on press TV, uh, don't associate with press TV, uh, you know, uh, it, it's sending a pretty, pretty clear message of trying to intimidate alternative media. And that seems to be a pattern we're seeing in recent years. You know, there's been a huge amount of demonization and pressure placed on RT, um, you know, I mean, there's been, you know, this kind of witch hunting in the mainstream press against against anyone who would say anything good about Russia. Um, and now we're seeing an attack on press TV, an English language TV network from Iran. Uh, meanwhile, you know, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, Fox News has people that are shareholders that are from Saudi Arabia. There doesn't seem to be any issue with that. Um, you know, and then Saudi Arabia went as far as, as killing Jamal Khashoggi, and the Trump administration gave them a pass. So there's a clear double standard here. You know, there's not a witch hunt against the, the British Broadcasting Corporation, BBC. Uh, France 24 is doing just fine. But media that comes from countries that are challenging U.S. foreign policy around the world tends to be treated very, very differently. And I think this fits in with that pattern, and it's very scary. Yeah, it, it's, I mean, so much of this... It, you know, it always just seems to kind of come down to the petrodollar and the American military industrial complex at, at, at any at any turn. That's what it is. I mean, we've been doing this with Iran since the 50s. I mean, when when they had a democratically elected leader that wanted to nationalize the oil and we got him out of there for the Shah, you know, who was a brutal dictator. I mean, we've been playing this. I mean, during the Bush years, the, Iran was trying to back channel peace to the Bush administration. And we said no. And we just got we got because we it, it's crazy. I mean, it's 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 I don't know. I don't know how anybody outside of them. I mean, the rest of the world just has to view us as we're the we're the big evil empire. I mean, that's I, and when we're just jailing people, when we when we have the audacity to scream about humanitarian rights and free press and all this stuff, we don't we don't we don't care that this is happening or we're not aware of it. And the corporate media won't do it because you know Boeing and Raytheon buy ad time with them. And then when somebody like uh, Serena Shim was was you know had a very questionable death you know we don't even investigate it we don't even talk about it and um yeah it, it, it's it's it, I, yeah I, i'm just sort of bewildered here because it's it's that this woman can just get snatched up and of course 
oh, if she's got, uh, you know, the Muslim hijab on, well, she must be just automatic terrorist, no charges. And I think my, my guess is, is that they were hoping that no one would know. Like it must be a, a small piece of luck that she was in contact with her family, that her family is aware of this and can even track because that's what they do. They just like scoop you up in a black bag and you're gone and you have no, nobody knows. And if, you know, they've, they've, they've just done that indiscriminately. Sure. I mean, her family didn't even hear from her for 48 hours until finally she was able to make a phone call and contact them and tell them that she'd been detained. But, you know, I spent a lot of time in the Islamic Republic Iran, uh, of Iran a few years back. But one particular memory sticks with me um, because I remember at one point they took me to a graveyard uh, near uh, the capital city of Tehran. And I was actually able to witness the burial of some Iranians who had died in Syria on the battlefield against ISIS, you know, and, and that gets kind of glossed over in American media, but you know, they always portray Iran like it's this brutal terrorist country. Well, Iran was in Syria fighting against the ISIL terrorists, and I remember, you know, a family member who had lost one of their relatives, uh, you know, on the battlefield in Syria said, you know, why aren't we on the same side in Syria, you know? It was al-Qaeda. It was the Wahhabi extremists with an ideology that comes from Saudi Arabia. They're the ones that attacked you on September 11th. You know, why can't the Americans and the Iranians come together to defeat terrorism? And if you think about it, you know, this whole war on terror, we haven't been fighting the terrorists. We've been fighting independent governments that, that are opposed to terrorism. Um, I mean, that's that's the craziest thing about it. Like you said, there was an, a, an attempt to try and have back channel for peace after September 11th with Iran trying to work with the United States. That's because Iran has been fighting against Wahhabi extremists and Sunni separatists for years. The bin Laden crowd hates the Islamic Republic of Iran. They call them Shia apostates. One of the main goals of the ISIS terrorists is actually to overthrow the Islamic Republic of Iran. That's one of their main goals. But the same thing with Syria. The Syrian government, you know, they've been, they've been fighting against these extremist forces and, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood and forces like that for a long time. And right after 9-11, they made overtures to the USA and they said, great, let's be on the same team. Gaddafi said the same thing. He said, you know, hey, let's be on the same team here. We're fighting against these forces. Saddam Hussein. The countries that we have overthrown have been independent countries, many of which were secular. Now, Iran, that's a religious government, but Syria, Iraq, Libya, those are, are secular, independent governments that have been the biggest enemies of the al-Qaeda terrorists that there are. Uh, so the whole thing, the whole notion that we're fighting Islamic terrorism by opposing Iran doesn't make any sense. The, the Islamic terrorists and extremists of ISIS and al-Qaeda, they're the enemies of the Iranians. Uh, Iran does not want to have a fight with the United States. Iran wants to protect itself from, from these Sunni Wahhabi extremists uh, who largely follow an ideology that's very popular and pushed by the Saudi government and that they really want to destroy the, the Shia Iranians. Um, and I was in Iran, and I'll tell you, you know, I went to church on Sunday morning in Iran. If I had been in Saudi Arabia, I wouldn't have been able to do that. In Saudi Arabia, there is no Christianity. It's, an, it's Islam, Sunni Islam only. But when I, was, when I was in Iran, I went to church on Sunday morning as a Christian. Nobody spit on me. And I'll say that, you know, Christians in Iran are treated way better than Muslims are treated in the United States. I'll say that for sure. Um, and, you know, I mean, there in Iran, you have, you know, people that are not Muslim. You have uh, Zoroastrians, an, a religion that's older than Islam and Christianity, a very old faith. Uh, they, you know, they follow the ancient prophet uh, in Iran, the ancient Persian prophet Zoroaster. That's widely practiced there. Uh, you know, Iran, Iran is very much a, a country that allows religious freedom for those who practice monotheism. Uh, that, you know, there are Christians, there are Jews in Iran, I actually saw an Iranian synagogue, there are even members of the Iranian parliament who are Jewish. Uh, you know, Iran is not, is not what people portray it as. Uh, one thing I jokingly said after I'd been to Iran a few times is everything that Americans think is true about Iran is actually true about Saudi Arabia. Well, that's a great point. And it really, because it's deliberate to keep, you know, like they were celebrating Christmas in Damascus, you know, and the, sure. there's this high, high, you know, high level or a, a, a large amount of Christians in Syria, in Iran. And, you know, it would be as if other countries' news were only showing like that crazy Baptist church in Kansas that protests soldiers' funerals because, you know, that holds up the God hates fag signs. It would be like if America was depicted as only that and only the Klan and that's your view of America was just that and, and not anything else. No, no people on the left, no, no, no nothing. And that's how we, that's how a, the Middle East is just all 
crazy terrorists that just run around and blah, 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 and blow shit up. That's the only way that, that, that uh, the Middle East is depicted. And especially Iran, like, it's a very forward-thinking country in a lot of ways in, in the Middle East with a lot of the things you touched on. I mean, uh, young people in bands and watching, you know, Western entertainment and culture. And then we just... We just come in and, and, and just make these sweeping generalizations. I think the, the, the upside or the, the, the positive that I'm trying to find in all of this is that there's more people such as yourself and people are, are realizing the corporate media is nonsense and trying to go where else? Anywhere, YouTube and I mean like, and trying to get information elsewhere because that is why I'm seeing so many like millennials who are waking up you know i just did this progressive comedy tour in florida and we had movement for a people's party at representing at a lot of shows and every and we've had the the democratic socials of america and every time the dsa shows up they are young they're like 18 to 25 year olds who are just like this is this whole system is nonsense and we want to change it so i guess i'm trying to i don't know i'm trying to find some silver linings here but um before we go, uh, first, thank you so much for, for sure. taking the time and giving us all this information. And what are some, uh, you know, parting words or, or actions people watching the show can do to help get the word out about this? Well, I, I think the main thing is that, you know, keep track of social media uh, because there's been a hashtag started, free Marzia Hashimi, uh, pray for Marzia Hashimi. And, uh, you know, her relatives are deeply concerned. She's got a lot of family over here. She's from New Orleans. She's got family in Colorado and elsewhere. And they're deeply worried about this grandmother and, and this important member of their family. Um, and there's a lot of, you know, Iranians that are very worried about this. But, you know, I, I wanted to touch on what you had said before because, you know, I Iran is the first country to tell you. If you go there, they'll tell you, we need reform. We have problems with human rights. There are things about the way we do things that are not as modern as they should be. But it's the Islamic Republic of Iran. Iran has a constitution. It has elections. It has presidents, right? Uh, you know, go to Saudi Arabia. That's an absolute monarchy. That's the political form that went out of fashion around the world in the 1400s. Um, and if you go to, you know, Kuwait, Oman, uh, you know, all the U.S. aligned regimes in that region tend to be really blatant autocracies. And Iran is a country where you have women voting, you've got women in the parliament, uh, you've got, actually got women generals in the Iranian military. Iran has been really trying to modernize. Um, and, you know, you, you talked about, you talked about the, you know, the, the coup that took place and the overthrow of Mossadegh. And, you know, I mean, there's much more. I mean, you can go over the Shah, the brutal dictator that was backed for many years. Every Iranian's got a family member who was tortured under the Shah or killed. You know, the, the Iraq-Iran war where the United States was supporting Saddam Hussein when he invaded Iran and, and killed almost a million people and used chemical weapons. I mean, the Iranians, uh, you know, have, have all kinds of reasons to be very angry at the United States. But that's not the experience that I had when I went there. When I went there, people thought I, because I was a, you know, a, an American from Ohio, they thought I was the coolest thing ever. People all wanted to meet me and ask me what life was like over here. And they really, it was made very clear to me that most Iranians, while they, they may not like our system, and that's what that whole death to America chant is about. They're chanting against the system, the global system of monopoly capitalism, which they identify with the United States. But most Iranians, when it gets down to it, wish that they could have a better relationship with the USA. They wish that American companies and Iranian companies were doing business. Uh, they wish that they could have more, more culture over there. Pink Floyd is like the most popular music in Iran. There is a radio station in Tehran that plays nothing but Pink Floyd music 24 hours a day. And a lot of, especially younger Iranians, are just enamored with the United States and, and don't want a big war. Um, and, and when it comes to the ISIS terrorists, uh, you know, they, they think, hey, why is the USA going after us? Why don't we team up against this, this menace uh, of Wahhabi terrorism, of head shoppers and such? You know, and so I, I think that everything that we think we know about Iran is really wrong. And the fact that they've grabbed, you know, this, this reporter... Um, you know, this, this journalist who was just going to visit her family. She was just back in the United States, the country she was born in, to visit mm -hmm. her family. And the fact that she's been grabbed, that, that's deeply problematic. And we really, we all hope that she can be released and that, you know, the U.S. government that constantly goes around the world lecturing different countries about freedom of the press and free speech will actually live up to those ideals at home and, and let a reporter continue to do her job and, and visit her family. Well, 
Caleb, thanks for shedding so much light on that. And, uh, you know, it's something most of us here uh, behind the red, white, and blue curtain can't see. <laughs> and sure. uh, um, we really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, everybody watching the show, I'll put uh, your, what, your Twitter feed? We want people to follow you on sure. Twitter? Yeah. yeah. So I'll put your Twitter feed in there. Follow Caleb. He's a journalist, a correspondent with RT. And thank you so much for taking the time out. And everybody, as he said, uh, repost this video with the, I'll put the hashtag in the show notes as well, uh, that we can help uh, at least try to get some kind of pressure or answers about why this woman was detained with no charges. So uh, yeah. th thank you, everybody. Thank you, Caleb, for the time. And thank you, everybody, for watching the show. Please, of course, like, subscribe, do all that stuff. And thank you for watching. Thank you.